Ever since Jurassic Park, we've dreamed of recreating dinosaurs. They ruled the Earth for over 100 million years. Who wouldn't want to see them up close? But the science behind this fantasy seemed impossible. Until now. Today, new science is blending paleontology and genetics. A new breed of dino hunter is using remarkable genetic advances to explore the DNA of dinosaurs' descendants, the birds. Their expeditions into DNA are discovering ancient traits that once belonged to dinosaurs. I think that all birds are able to grow teeth. We're getting these dinosaurian-like tails starting to develop inside a modern bird. Not just teeth and tails, but even scales and hands. They're reviving the possibility of creating a living, breathing dinosaur, but in a different way than you ever imagined. We're getting closer. The, the technology is racing. I don't think there are really any barriers other than philosophical. Will science ever be able to bring back dinosaurs? Recreating dinosaurs might not be a smart idea, but in the future, will it ever be possible? To carry it out, we would need a source of dinosaur DNA. Surprisingly, today there are hints that we may be able to find it. The first attempt begins in 1992, when Raul Cano and his former student Hendrik Poinar conceive a strange experiment. They'll try to recover DNA from an insect almost as old as the dinosaurs. It's trapped in amber, a sticky tree sap that hardened into a transparent stone. Speculation about the possibility had inspired the Jurassic Park story. Kano decides to actually try it. This is a bee, a stingless bee, probably 25, 30 million years old. This is an ant, you can see the head. They have the thorax and the abdomen. This is a fly. You can see the tissue is very well preserved. Pictures like this created the possibility of having Jurassic Park because uh, it's possible that some of these organisms may have taken a blood meal from a dinosaur and preserved the DNA of the dinosaur. The idea seems clever, but impossible, until Kano decides to search for ancient DNA with a new technique that can detect the tiniest DNA fragments. They begin by sterilizing the amber. Then, they add freezing liquid nitrogen. Uh, now it's, uh, the liquid nitrogen is, is boiling over, and the amber's gonna get real cold and it's gonna crack. And finally, you'll be able to have access to the interior, and then you can collect the samples. Next, Kano grinds up the tissue and adds chemicals that make millions of copies of the tiniest DNA fragments allowing them to be detected on a gel. After many trials, amazingly, they succeed in detecting a small sequence of DNA from a 40 million year old bee. Soon after, scientists at the American Museum of Natural History recovered DNA from an ancient termite. Suddenly, the impossible seems possible. Although the chances are slim, and the fragments would be small, it appears that we may actually be able to find dinosaur DNA. But then, the bottom falls out. Over the next few years, all attempts to replicate the experiments fail, and the extreme sensitivity of the DNA test leads to suspicion that the recovered tiny fragments were contaminants. One has to be extremely careful to make sure that you do not introduce DNA into the sample. Uh, from the air, or from your lips, or from your hair, or your clothing, you're always running the risk of uh, amplifying the wrong thing. Scientists have now abandoned the search for DNA preserved in amber. But since then, researchers have recovered longer stretches of ancient DNA from a 40,000-year-old mammoth and 45,000-year-old Neanderthal bones. So why not from dinosaurs? The problem is that DNA is weak. As dinosaurs fossilize, bacteria, water, changes in temperature, and cosmic rays all break it down. Today, many scientists doubt that DNA can survive for more than a few million years. It appears that recreating dinosaurs will never be possible.
and surprisingly, hopes of finding dinosaur DNA unexpectedly revive. This time, it may come directly from a dinosaur. Famed paleontologist Jack Horner was an advisor to the Jurassic Park films. He discovered the first evidence that dinosaurs cared for their young, and he has pioneered the use of groundbreaking new techniques, like this laser mapping tool. Now, he sparks another breakthrough. In 2003, in the Montana Badlands, Horner's team is excavating a remarkably well-preserved T-Rex skeleton. But the site is so remote, they can only carry it out by helicopter. And the thigh bone is too heavy. They have to break it in two. People just don't normally go around and break their bones open. And even for us, this was a time we just broke it because it was the only way to get it out. Horner gives a piece of the bone to his former student, paleontologist Mary Schweitzer. She examines it and immediately notices an unusual bone structure inside. It resembles a distinctive type of bone found only in pregnant birds. Puzzled, she asks her assistant Jennifer Whitmire to do something rarely done before. They place it in an acid solution to dissolve away some of the minerals on the surface. Six hours later, Whitmire looks again. She ran into the room, she says, you are not going to believe this. But when she picked up a small piece to stop the reaction by putting it in water, it stretched. And it sproined and it moved all over the place. So we knew we had something pretty unusual. It appears to be soft tissue. It's unimaginable to find soft tissue. It was just assumed that everything had been fossilized and therefore there wouldn't be soft tissue. When they look at neighboring parts of the bone, they're even more surprised. Out popped the blood vessels, and they were pretty incredible. And I said, I don't believe it, that's not possible, we need to do it again, and again. It's one of those just goosebump-inducing scientific moments, that's all I can say, and I, they don't really happen very often. Blood vessels should not exist in fossilized bone. Many scientists believe organic molecules can't last more than 100,000 years. Yet Schweitzer's bone is 68 million years old. I think the presence of soft tissues and cells indicates there's a process going on that we didn't have a clue about. So I think it means that we have to kind of rethink the whole chemical process of making a bone turn into a fossil. Now, Schweitzer and Horner begin searching for more soft tissue. Do bones on museum shelves around the world contain dinosaur tissue with protein and perhaps even DNA? Okay, I got it. At Montana State University, they look for another promising bone to sacrifice. Sorry, down right here. I feel really bad that it took a long time and a lot of work to put this thing together. I mean, you can see all the cracks and stuff in it, but now we get to break it apart. <laughs> It doesn't matter how well it preserved it is or how nice it looks. We are going to go inside. This is the spot. That spot looks good. Their instrument of choice, a hammer and chisel. And we're just going to pull it apart. Yeah. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, here it comes. For treatment, these two seem to contain soft tissue. But she still needs to prove it. So she turns to a powerful electron microscope. And now, at 4,000 times magnification, she sees tiny structures preserved in such detail that they are unlikely to be mineralized fossil. They appear to be microscopic cells that build dinosaur bones. This is an osteocyte. This is a bone-forming cell from a dinosaur. Osteocytes are really distinctive because they have these little cellular extensions that they call philopodia, which means little feet. Schweitzer's bone seems to preserve soft tissue. It should tell us more about the biology of these ancient beasts, and it may even contain dinosaur DNA. At this point, I think pretty much anything is possible. But if it does, could we ever use it to recreate an ancient dinosaur? It's unlikely. We can only hope to recover minuscule fragments of gigantic DNA molecules. You know, even if you were to have some way of finding DNA and finding little pieces and, and hoping that every time you found a new little piece it was a piece you didn't have before, the chances of ever finding enough to make a dinosaur is 
is just virtually impossible, I think. So the Jurassic Park scenario will never work, at least with today's technology. But Horner sees a new method on the horizon that could create a living dinosaur in our lifetime. Jack Horner realizes we'll never recover enough ancient DNA to make a dinosaur. But now he sees powerful new tools, revolutionary advances in genetics, that create a new possibility of making a dinosaur in the flesh. If we want to see a dinosaur in our lifetime, there, there is the possibility um, of starting with a bird and working backwards. Basically, retro-engineering a bird using its ancestral DNA and flipping the right switches. We could theoretically turn a bird into a dinosaur. Horner's strange case hinges on settling a long-standing controversy, the claim that dinosaurs have living descendants. Birds. On the face of it, they don't look similar. Some scientists believe that although they evolved from a common ancestor, they're not directly related. But to Horner, the differences fade away on closer examination. In the 1990s, scientists began discovering many dinosaurs in China, buried in a fine ash that preserved unusual detail, such as retractable claws, teeth, and feathers, just like birds. But that's just the beginning. What characterizes a bird? People, you know, instantly say feathers. But, you know, we have dinosaurs that have feathers. So that is not a unique character to birds. They say hollow bones, but the theropod dinosaurs have hollow bones. Oblong eggs. Dinosaurs have oblong eggs. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on and on. And virtually every characteristic that we think of as, as being unique to birds, dinosaurs invented. Most paleontologists now believe that ancient birds descended from the raptors, a class of theropods that includes the velociraptor. Hey, you guy, come here. Come here. But to Horner and some of his colleagues, there is one surefire way to prove that birds evolved from dinosaurs. By demonstrating that scientists can turn back the evolutionary clock and retro-engineer a dinosaur from a bird. It sounds far-fetched, but when you realize how many characteristics they share in common, it sounds pretty easy. And the startling advances that may make this possible? Horner and some of his colleagues believe that a modern bird's DNA contains a genetic memory. And most genes for dinosaur traits are still there. They are just turned off or slightly modified. The science behind this strange claim comes from a recent breakthrough in solving one of science's greatest mysteries. How a single cell grows into a complex organism, like a dinosaur or a human. Because our DNA is so huge, biologists always assume that roughly 100,000 genes must shape our body's development. But then scientists decoded our genome, the entire sequence of human DNA. Sean Carroll is a leading geneticist investigating this mystery. There were estimates that maybe humans might have, say, 100,000 genes relative to maybe other animals having 20,000 or 30,000 or something like that, and that was just vaporized. Despite our remarkable complexity, we only have about 20,000 genes, roughly the same number as other mammals, reptiles, birds, and dinosaurs. In 1994, Carol makes a new discovery that shows that closely related species like dinosaurs and birds have even more genes in common. He discovers that the butterfly reuses an ancient bodybuilding gene in a new way. In the caterpillar, the gene tells the body where to form antenna and legs. But as the caterpillar turns into a butterfly, the same gene tells the wing where to make spots. So keep your eye on the green spots. Voila, each green spot is what's going to be the dead center, the white area of each of these eye spots. And that is the way a lot of evolution happens. It's by very old genes picking up new tricks. Carol believes we have found a solution to one of evolution's greatest mysteries, 
how new features arise. New species often emerge, not by evolving new genes, but by using old genes in new ways, by changing when and where their genes turn on and off. These breakthroughs mean that a bird's DNA is much more similar to the DNA of its dinosaur ancestors than we ever thought possible. Really, the inventory of genes in a bird would be very similar to the inventory of genes in a dinosaur. It's just the choreography of the use of those genes during development that has differed. So really, there's tremendous genetic continuity that connects birds to dinosaurs, but it's little differences in decision-making during development that makes a whole difference between you know, a chicken and a tyrannosaurus. To Jack Horner, these breakthroughs lead to a stunning revelation. The bird genome is, is basically a dinosaur genome. So all we have to do is tweak it a little bit, and we should have a dinosaur. Suddenly, the challenge of recreating dinosaurs has become much easier. For paleontologist Jack Horner, startling new advances in genetics create a fascinating new possibility. Birds are carrying the genetic memory of their ancestors. So we can re-retro-engineer, basically, dinosaur characters from a bird. Horner's belief rests on experiments that are already uncovering these dinosaur features. His colleague Hans Larsen at McGill University is conducting one of these experiments. Larsen is searching for the genetic changes that turn dinosaurs' long tails into birds' short tails over 150 million years ago. This is a Albertosaurus, a relative of the T-Rex. And this guy has a tail that begins right here at the hips and goes all the way back for about 35 vertebrae. When we get to the very first bird, Archaeopteryx, they have about 15 vertebrae in their tails. And by the time we get to modern birds, like the chicken, we only have five to eight vertebrae in their tails. And with this kind of a transition, in a very, very sort of short period of time, I'll bet that the chicken and all modern birds have the ability to develop a long dinosaurian tail. Larson is a new breed of paleontologist at the forefront of a new field. He's helped discover seven new species, including a giant carnivore in the Arctic. But he's equally at home in the genetics lab and eager to apply molecular techniques to the study of dinosaurs. He begins by studying the development of a normal chicken's tail more closely than anyone has before. He stains embryos at different stages of development. And as he peers at an embryo, just one and a half days old, he is startled. Larson expects to see four to eight vertebra, like the adult chicken. But instead we're finding right off the bat, and very easy to find, uh, up to 16 vertebrae fully formed inside the early developing chicken embryo. So we're seeing that we have these really, or really fairly elongate tails, these sort of reptile looking tails on birds uh, early in development. And then if we follow it through development, we see that it gets shorter and shorter and shorter until they hatch. And then we have only about five vertebrae left in the tail. Larson has discovered that the chicken embryo has a tail almost as long as an Archaeopteryx, the transitional animal between dinosaurs and birds. So for about 150 million years, this kind of a tail has never existed in birds, but they've always carried it uh, deep inside their embryology. Now Larson is trying to reverse evolution. Can he make an adult chicken grow a long dinosaur tail? He starts with a list of genes he suspects control the tail's growth. He'll see what happens if these genes are kept on longer than usual. Larson implants a bead at the end of the developing tail. It contains the same protein that a gene would manufacture if it stayed active after it normally shuts off. Several days later, he looks to see if the developing tail is longer than normal. One by one, he experiments with different genes. And after several months, he hits the jackpot. Here's what we found. We found that we could extend the tail a little bit longer. So now we have three more vertebrae added into the tail. And moreover, I think even more exciting for me, is that the scaffolding that all the vertebrae are developing onto is enlarging as well. Larson suspects that the genetic system for developing a dinosaur tail is intact in modern birds. It just turns off earlier. 
this tells us what's actually responsible for going from a dinosaur shape to a bird shape. And now we can go straight to the heart of the question. We can go right to the genetics, right to the base pairs of the genome and see what's changing between these things. Larson is turning back the genetic clock millions of years. I see no reason why we could not um, develop experimentally a completely dinosaurian looking tail in a modern bird. The system for developing that is, is in place. If birds can make dinosaur tails, why not teeth? Since a bird's DNA contains a dinosaur tail, does it also contain other dinosaur features? Occasionally, an ancient evolutionary feature pops up naturally as an atavism, a repressed ancestral trait. This recently discovered dolphin has vestigial legs. Modern dolphins no longer have them, but their ancestors did. The genes that trigger the formation of legs are now turned off, but the genetic circuit to make them is still there, and once in a blue moon, a mutation turns it back on. Sometimes, human babies are born with another atavism, a tail, complete with vertebra, a reminder of our ancestral past. In 2005, Matt Harris and John Fallon at the University of Wisconsin discover a new atavism that links birds to dinosaurs. Late one night, Harris is studying the development of feathers in a strain of mutant chickens. As he peers in an embryo only 14 days old, he notices something strange. Looking at the head, I came across the beak and there these structures were that were not supposed to be there. They look like teeth. He shows it to Fallon, his advisor, and together they try to make sense of it. We were shocked. Yeah. When a chicken smiles at you, it's something. But are they really teeth? What would birds' teeth even look like? We started to talk about what the closest living relative of birds would be, and that would be the crocodilians, and alligators would be something we could get our hands on. They peel away the beak to examine the structures more closely, and clearly see that they are saber-shaped, just like the teeth of alligators. They even section their structure and compare it with a section of an alligator tooth at the same stage of development. What we see here is that in an embryonic alligator, you have little bumps, which is actually the formation of these embryonic teeth. In the mutants, you get expression in the same regions, the same developmental programs are being turned on. Teeth are developing in this mutant. <laughs> Their chicken is on its way to developing teeth similar to alligators, T-Rex, and Archaeopteryx. But do all chickens still have this ancient dinosaur circuitry? Harris decides to see if he can create teeth in a normal chicken. He opens an egg and injects a virus into the spot in the embryo that is developing into the beak. The virus will insert itself into the chicken's DNA and carry with it a gene that initiates the development of teeth in other animals. Harris suspects that this gene is present, but simply turned off in the region of the embryo that forms the beak. But his experiment is a long shot. Making a tooth is a very complex structure. And so the idea of turning on one gene might be able to do this in an animal that hasn't made teeth in over 70 million years was somewhat of a stretch. It's like stretch, like a Hail Mary does. Two weeks later, he examines his embryo and discovers a link to Bird's ancestral past. So this is what we found. It's very exciting. Now, this is actually the, the mouth of one of these experimental chickens. And well, you can see very clearly the fact that you grow paired structures here on the lower jaw that look like teeth. And so the normal chicken can actually grow teeth. We were both very surprised. Yeah, it's, it was totally unexpected. It now appears that birds still have the evolutionary memory to make the beginning stages of teeth. A regulating gene that tells the beak to make teeth is no longer activated. And they have the same curved shape as the teeth of dinosaurs. Now researchers are finding other dinosaur traits in the DNA of birds, like scales and hands. It could make the job of recreating a dinosaur even easier.
Does a bird's DNA still contain the genes to make a dinosaur? What about those long feathers? Surprisingly, new experiments show that genetic engineering could give a bird scaly skin, just like a Triceratops or a T-Rex. Matt Harris and John Fallon believe they have stumbled upon the genes that turn dinosaur scales into feathers. The first clue came when they began working with an ancient Chinese breed of chicken called a silky bird. The silky has primitive fluffy feathers, closer to what scientists believe feathered dinosaurs sported. But Fallon and Harris are struck by how this naturally occurring mutant bird is different from other birds. If you look at the normal bird, you can see the scales here, and if you look at the silky breed, what you see is there are feathers. Clearly, birds have the genes to make both. And there is another similarity between scales and feathers. But they are really made of the same protein, which is called keratin, the same as in our fingernails. Harris and others have already discovered that two genes orchestrate the complex development of feathers. On a hunch, he decides to try tricking a chicken's leg into growing feathers by turning on one of the feather-making genes before scales form. He coats the leg of the embryo with a protein that the gene would manufacture. Then, he waits. The blue stain reveals the action of the gene in the chicken leg as primitive feathers develop. Harris and Fallon have made rudimentary feathers emerge instead of scales. The first initial observation was just pure amazement. But one got John and he saw that and said, absolutely, there was no question. The researchers are uncovering the precise genetic changes that took place as dinosaur scales evolved into feathers. Their experiments suggest that with modest tinkering, it may be possible to turn back the evolutionary clock and replace a bird's feathers with scaly skin like a dinosaur's. I would think as we learn more that we'll be able to do that. The genetic knowledge is there in the bird, and if we have it correct that the ancestors of the birds were scaly, then we should be able to induce scales on a bird. Another difference between dinosaurs and birds seems harder to reconcile. Dinosaurs have hands, while birds have wings. But Hans Larsen has found that they too are genetically similar. Dinosaurs closely related to birds have three really long fingers in their hands. So one, two, and three. And these fingers are very, very adapted for grasping and snatching prey. If we now compare this to modern birds, we see that they also have three fingers in their hand. We might not see this all the time, but here's one, two, three fingers. But they're highly modified for flight. We now know that we can trace the three fingers in the bird hand back to these three fingers in the dinosaur hand, both genetically and anatomically. Larson has little doubt that with more research, we'll be able to transform a bird's wing back into a dinosaur hand. Genetic experiments like these by Larson, Fallon, and Harris are untangling the evolutionary links between dinosaurs and birds. For most scientists, that's enough. But they also raise an intriguing possibility. If someone were crazy enough to try to create a proto-dinosaur from a bird, could they ever succeed? The possibility rests on the tremendous rate at which we are sequencing genomes, the full blueprint of an animal's DNA. Machines called sequencers are decoding the entire DNA map. We're even decoding individual genes. And we've not just decoded the human genome, but also horses, cats, dogs, mice, and the chicken. To make a dinosaur, Jack Horner would start with the genome of an emu. Emus have all the features that, that we could easily start with in order to make you know, a velociraptor-sized dinosaur. Big enough. You know, to already, already have the size. The uh, feathers are very, very similar to the impressions of feathers that we find in China. Look at the feet. They have scales. I mean, they're just, they're scaly feet. This is the dinosaur foot. If I was going to make a dinosaur, I'd start with this guy.
scientists would begin with the emu genome and add dinosaur traits. They could give an emu a tail, lengthen its arms and give it hands instead of wings. They could give it scaly bumpy skin or proto feathers like many raptors had. They could bulk up its leg muscles and even give it teeth and possibly the digestive system of a meat-eating modern bird, like a vulture. That's me, is an animal that is going to look an awful lot like a dinosaur. We might call it an Emuosaurus. But how different would Horner's creature be from an ancient dinosaur? It might slightly resemble the raptor Troodon. And the fossil record reveals evidence of bird-like behavior in dinosaurs, like tending eggs, flocking, and scavenging. Birds care for their young, dinosaurs cared for their young. Birds are very social, dinosaurs were very social. All the behaviors that we know of in dinosaurs are similar to what, what they are in birds. Hans Larsen believes that some new behaviors might even emerge on their own. Once we put a long tail on a, on a, let's say, an experimental bird embryo, its behavior might very well change to compensate for the long tail. It's not going to presumably get a smaller brain and, and have different sort of structure inside its brain and different connections the way that we think dinosaurs would have had. But it may alter its behavior ever so slightly just to accommodate its newfound body shape, which in turn might be the same pattern that dinosaurs would have done anyways. And its intelligence? Horner believes that the social complexity and smarts of dinosaurs were no greater than a bird's. If anything, some birds might be smarter. But could we ever truly build an Emuosaurus? And if so, how? If we could create the genes of a proto-dinosaur, could we ever build one as they did in Jurassic Park? It sounds easy. You begin with the DNA of an emu, slightly tweak its genes to give it new traits, implant the DNA in an emu egg, and presto, you have an animal. But, as you guessed, it's not that simple. First, we would have to make our dinosaur DNA. Luckily, we already have machines that do it. These synthesizers string together the primary units of DNA called base pairs. At the moment, machines can only make DNA strands that are 600,000 base pairs long, while a bird's DNA contains 1.8 billion base pairs. But gene synthesizers are developing fast, and you may not have to recreate all of the DNA. You may just have to replace small selected parts. We already have small artificial chromosomes that have been put into embryos and develop and divide and express their genes. The technology is advancing so fast in terms of being able to not only sequence genes, but also the ability to put those genes back together and manufacture long stretches of DNA. I think the technology is there to do it. If we succeed in making dinosaur DNA, could we make an animal from it? Amazingly, this technology may exist in a cloning lab. Mark Westhusen knows as much about creating life from DNA as anyone in the world. He and his colleague Dewey Kramer at Texas A&M University have cloned more species than researchers at any other laboratory. He loves these apples. They've cloned white-tailed deer, a black Angus bull, see this big baby, and this cat, which now has kittens of her own. To make an Emuosaurus, we would have to begin with an egg from an emu, just as Westhusen uses an egg from a cow. His team begins by placing the egg under a dissecting microscope and prepping a suction pipette. First, we'd have to remove the existing DNA. So what we're going to do now is just pull out the DNA from the egg, enucleate it. Next, we'd have to insert the artificial DNA into the emu egg. And so what we have here is a cell that in this case represents a bovine cell. The challenge is to, to inject that cell into the, the space here. After that, we'd have a process where we'd actually fuse those two cells together so that we tra effectively transfer the chromosomes inside the cytoplasm of this egg. And then that egg will basically treat it um, as if it treats a sperm. We'd have to find just the right mix of chemicals to kickstart the fertilization process. And last, 
we'd implant the fertilized egg into an emu and hope that it will develop and hatch. But even this is not as easy as it sounds. In just the last 10 years, we've discovered that we need more than DNA to create a living embryo. The egg also contributes vital molecules that latch on to DNA and initiate the complex timing of when genes begin to turn on and off. No one knows if a modern emu egg would provide just the right chemical mix for the genes in ancient DNA to spring to life. Clearly, making a dinosaur from scratch is a huge undertaking. But that doesn't mean it's impossible. If we could come up with viable DNA, which is, again, one of the critical parts to the whole, I think, equation, then I think it's, it's reasonable to assume that we, uh, we could get the system to work. All the evidence so far suggests that it, it probably can be done. Our scientists have done things which nobody's ever done before. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't start to think they should. Today, no scientist is trying to create a theme park animal as they did in Jurassic Park. They want to understand how evolution works. Experiments like theirs are giving us more insight into the genetic history of modern animals, and even ourselves. But with enough time and money, could someone ever create a dino-like creature from a bird? Sean Carroll sees many obstacles along the way. We could imagine taking some sort of stab about how to change this trait or that trait. It would be a lot of trial and error. It's an unimaginable number of steps. So I, I wouldn't pretend to, to imagine how long it would take us to, to make any sort of progress in that direction. But Jack Horner believes that in less than 50 years it will be possible. I have no doubt that, that it could happen. I think the chances of recreating uh, a bird with a lot of dinosaur characteristics is very high. Hans Larsen goes further. He believes that in a hundred years or so, it would be possible to retro-engineer animals that look just like the ancient dinosaurs. One could take everything we know about development, all the genetics, all the non-genetics parts of it, and we could probably create any kind of anatomy that we see out there. Why can't we take all that information, just change around a little bit, and produce a T-Rex? Or something that looks just like a T-Rex. I think that kind of a, of a scenario is quite possible. Maybe sooner than we think. Have we seen the last of Jurassic Park? Maybe not. You know, I have to admit that I've, I've certainly imagined walking up on a stage to give a talk and having a little, little dino chicken or whatever you want to call him walk up behind me. That'd be kind of cool. <laughs>